Hello and welcome to Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show, talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This week I'm talking to Julian Lalo about his work, NFTs and a range of other topics I hope you'll find interesting. When first picking up the camera in 2015, photography was for Julian nothing more than a hobby an excuse to hang out with friends and take photos of their sneakers. But it very quickly progressed to something much more than that. It became an obsession, an obsession which led Julian to experiment with all genres of the craft, from street photography and landscapes to portraiture and food. Gaining work with recognised brands in international tourism and as an ambassador for Canon Australia. As his interests have shifted, so too has Julian's main focus and passion in photography, a shift towards fashion photography, a direction that's off to a great start, having been involved in campaigns both locally and internationally, with clients such as New Balance, Nana, Judy, Intimo, C. Folly and George and King. However, through the ever-evolving journey of his career as a photographer, one thing has remained the same. It still doesn't feel like work. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Julian. Welcome to the podcast. How are you going? Good. Thanks, Grant. Thanks for having me. Ah, pleasure. I'm really happy to have you on the show. I've been following your work for a while and uh, really pleased when you said yes to uh, uh, coming on the show. So tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into photography and, you know, why photography? Uh, yeah, so... I'm a Melbourne-based uh, photographer. I, I'm a full-time uh, photographer now and work predominantly in uh, fashion and food photography. Um, but photography for me started um, kind of in a roundabout way. It actually started through collecting sneakers. So uh, probably about six, seven years back, I was big into, into sneaker collecting and, and um, there was a bit of a scene on Instagram where people would take on foot shots. So basically a selfie of your feet almost, um, to kind of flex your latest pair of sneakers. And through that, I started with a, with an iPhone, moved into a crop sensor DSLR, then moved into a full frame. And, and that kind of grew the passion for photography and lucky in a way, because I stopped spending money on, on sneakers and started (laughs) spending money on camera kit and which is actually, um, which is more expensive. Oh, I'd say the sneakers is more addictive, so it probably becomes more expensive. The beauty of the, the photography is that you can earn a little money off it. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, that, that's kind of how it all started. And uh, I was sort of chatting with a few photographers and they sort of looked at these photos of my sneakers and they said, well, these are great, but there's more to life than shooting sneakers. So I went on a few photo walks in Melbourne that were just and met, connected with a few people on Instagram and, then from that kind of got into the street, got into street photography, started shooting some portraits, started shooting some landscapes and it kind of was a bit of an evolution from there. Cool. And so you've turned it into a full-time career? Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say that that was sort of a process of about three and a half years before I went full-time with it. Um, Three and a half, maybe four years started with that little bit of kind of, people sending you bits and pieces, that little bit of contra work, and then it moved into some weekend gigs and until and the point where I went part-time with, with a job in, I was working in sales at the time, so I went part-time with my job in sales and part-time photography up until uh, a couple of years ago where I went full-time with it. Okay, cool. And how, I mean, obviously the uh, pandemic and everything's caused everybody a bit, bit of strife. How, how's it actually been going in that, that, that last couple of years? Yeah, the last, I mean, this this year's been great um, and probably since November last year, it's been really great. I kind of uh, run off my feet at the moment, which is which is a really great thing and, and really positive. But yeah, the, the, the year leading up to that, especially being here in Melbourne, I think the most locked down city in the world it was yeah. pretty, it had some tough moments, but it was also probably a really good time. One, I started a YouTube channel in that time. Mm-hmm. Um which I would never have had the time to do before that. So that's a photography based YouTube channel, which is, which has been great. And it also kind of made me really realize before leading into the pandemic, I was shooting everything from fashion to food and, and 
what you probably know me for and what most of social media knows me for is, is my landscapes. Yep. And that pandemic time really made me realize what I miss and what I want to pursue and where I want to direct my photography going forward. So in terms of a, an income, it wasn't great for a year and a half, but um, it was good for, I think, my future in, in photography going forward. Fantastic. Yeah. So what is it about, uh, you know, landscape photography and, you know, you're very well known for your, your foggy um, forest photography in particular. Um, what is it about that that really gets you going and gets you out into, you know, conditions, you know, when it's foggy and rainy and most people want to stay indoors and you're, you're out there in the, uh, in the forest uh, trying, to, trying to capture that atmosphere? What, what is it about it that makes you, makes you do that? Well, I guess, like I said, I mean, most of my work is, isn't is in landscape photography or, or travel photography. So it's the way for me to kind of, I guess, still harness that passion for, for photography and, and stay inspired. So, like I said, photography for me started as a hobby, but yep. like a lot of hobbies, when people turn their hobby into a career, they lose a little bit of passion, a little bit of spark. Yeah, sure. And then... It becomes work. And yeah, it becomes work. And what's the hobby? So for me, shooting those moody landscapes is is where I, I keep that creativity going and where photography is still a hobby and it's not work. Yeah. Um, as much as I say that, I, I'd love the work that I do, shooting fashion in particular, um, still doesn't feel like work. But, yeah, that's just sort of how I keep that that creative alive. And it also allows me to, you know, I'm between work and, and a young family. I don't have a lot of spare time. So it's also the time where I get to catch up with mates. Yeah. And um, just hang out and shoot and whether I come home with one or two great shots or I don't, I've, I've got up, I've got outdoors, I've achieved something by 9am, I've achieved something for the day and, and I've got to hang out with a few buddies. Yeah, no, nah, that's great. That's great. So you, you, you talked a little bit about, uh, you know, it being a hobby and then turning it into a, a career. So what was it that, you know, how did you go through that decision-making process of deciding to make it a full-time career? Yeah, it was pretty. It was a pretty tough one, but made easier by getting um, an in-house photography position for the first little while of that transition. Mm -hmm. um, like anything, going into a freelance creative career, it's a pretty big step when you've gone from um, years of, I mean, 15, 16 years of a career uh, going freelance into a creative career is a pretty big, pretty big decision. So. The transition was made a little bit easier by going into a three day a week in-house role um, and that and that helped that transition. But I found that because, like I said, photography isn't really when it is work, it doesn't really feel like work. If you're, if you're doing the jobs that you enjoy, um, that was that kind of made me really want to push to do that so that I could move into something that that didn't feel like work. Yeah. yeah. And in, ter in terms of the work that you are doing, you know, in the food and uh, fashion industry, I guess. Are you able to pick and choose what you want to do or are you just still in that phase of just give me anything, bring it on, I'll, I'll do uh, anything? No, I'm, I'm at a, I mean, I, I definitely went through that phase, but I'm pretty, I feel very fortunate now to be in a position where I can be a little bit, a little bit choosy. Yep. And um, I'm a, and I'm also, so I've, I'm choosing the jobs that I take and, I, and I'm also choosing to start take on less and less food and shoot just more fashion. Yeah, fair enough. So I guess how far do you travel to, for, for your photography and, you know, what, what's the furthest you've gone for, to, to get a shot? Um, I guess, well, keeping it within Australia, I guess probably, probably about three hours uh, either side of Melbourne are some really great photography, landscape photography locations. Yep. Obviously, most people are aware of um, Great Ocean Road and the Twelve Apostles. Yep. And then, if you go in the other direction, you've got Wilson's. Uh, so you've got Wilson's Prom, and then the Grampians. So these destinations are all around that three, three and a half hour sort of uh, drive from Melbourne. Um, yep. So those, when you're shooting a sunrise or sunset, it's either a, a really early start or, or late night by the time you get home for those drives. And, sure. and then obviously I've, I've been lucky enough to travel to a few countries around the world and to get a few shots that I've, you know, that few of those bucket list shots. Yeah, no, great. So what, are there any particular uh, go-tos that you, you're always sort of drawn to and, you know, what, 
you know, obviously I'm not asking for your secret secret spots, but you know. <laughs> oh, most uh, of them are pretty pretty well known by now. But yeah, um, but I, I guess uh, are there any ones that you're particularly drawn to, and and why you're drawn to them? What what is it about those locations that makes you keep coming back? Yeah, I mean the the one that I'm probably makes up half of my Instagram feed would would probably be the Black Spur. Yeah, and that one's about probably about fifty minutes from. 50 minutes to an hour from Melbourne. And it's kind of, it's one of those spots that's beautiful regardless of the conditions. Mm -hmm. um, saying that, I hate shooting it with sunlight. I, I hate shooting most things with half <laughs> sunlight, but um, I, I really enjoy the drive through there. It's this beautiful winding road, really tall gums. And, and uh, I, I'm not going to try and work out, tell you what type of trees they are because I'll get it wrong and someone will. Some kind of eucalypt. <laughs> But yeah, someone that knows trees better than me will, will correct me. But um, the Black Spur is probably one of my favourite favorite spots. This beautiful long drive. And um, when you get fog in the right spots through that drive, it's, it's just a magic drive to start with. And then, and then uh, always great for, great for taking photos. The, the trees are, you know, super tall. And if you get a, if, and um, really put a, a sense of scale into, into things. So the Black Spur, it's nice and close to home and, and in the right conditions, it's beautiful. And when it's not the right conditions for photography, it's a beautiful drive all the same. Mm, no, fair enough. So are there any particular things that you're doing, I guess, that might be different to others and what is it about that that, you know, makes you do them and why, why do you do them? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if there's any things that I'm doing any sort of any different. That's a good one. You've stumped me there a bit. Right? But, <laughs> that's okay. Um, yeah, I guess because it's a... It's just a hobby in terms of the landscape stuff. I, I try not to take any of it too seriously. I try not to go with any expectations or shot in mind and just sort of get out there and, and shoot what I'm feeling on the day. Yeah, fair I enough. am not the greatest of editors, in my opinion. Um, so I think I leave, I, I shoot, the way you see my images is pretty close to how I shoot them. That's probably a little bit different. I, I leave them pretty pretty natural and um, try and give a real sense of kind of the conditions on the day. Uh, if anything, I, I'd say that's where, and that's probably maybe if I knew all the, all the Lightroom and Photoshop tricks of the trade, <laughs> um, maybe that'd be a different story. But I, I guess that's probably maybe where, I'd, where I'm a little bit different is, is the kind of the natural editing style um, that I use with my images. But in terms of the way I shoot, um, I'm not a technical photographer by any means. I actually took my, my cameras into Canon the other day and they said, you're about five updates behind on each of your, on each of your <laughs> camera bodies. So the tech doesn't, doesn't impress me. So I'm not super technical when I shoot either. I think I just keep it simple and, and that's probably my, keep it simple and enjoy it. And that's my point of difference. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. Fair enough. So I, I guess when, you, when you're out there in the field, are you looking to create something distinctive and recognisable in, in the landscape genre or are you looking for that one-of-a-kind shot? What, or, or do they just come along as they, as they come when you, when you get the opportunity? Yeah, I think with landscape photography, because the conditions are something completely out of your control, hmm. um, which is completely the opposite to fashion photography where I can control most things, yep. I think you kind of go there and work with what you're given. So I don't really go with any intention. Um, obviously, I, I go with um, some conditions that I would I would love to capture, but that doesn't always happen. So um, yeah, no no real intention other than other than the location I'd like to to shoot and kind of show off show off what I'm seeing on the day when I when I'm there. Yeah, sure. And so, if, I, yeah. if I can keep it, sorry, sorry. No, no, go on. In, in finishing your. Uh, in finishing your question, if I can keep it recognisable, recognisable to my style, I think that's probably something most photographers really aim for: is that someone can see an image without a name attached to it and say, "That's a Julian Lalo or "That's you know." Yep. Um, I think that that's sort of the ideal. Yeah, yeah. Have you have you reached that ideal? Do you think, or are you still working towards it? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, there's. Yeah, there's been times where I think my work, I think my my work's kind of ever evolving, and um, and trying to sort of mix it up a little bit at the moment. But I think there was definitely a time 
when I was shooting landscapes heavily um, and I was, and I had a lot of time to get out and shoot landscapes. I, I think it had reached that point where people were recognizing my work without seeing it. Yep. Um, now I've probably just with my interest shift and into, into sort of more fashion photography, I'm working towards it in, in that genre, I think a little more. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I, I'd like to explore that difference you you mentioned between you know the the studio photography versus you know landscape. I guess they're they're two very different conditions, particularly around lighting, where you can, as you said, virtually control everything in in the studio environment. What is it that you like and dislike about the two? What 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 are the you know what what, what are the things that you know, make you arc up and one of the things that you go, oh, that's just fantastic because I can, you know, I can either control it or I can't control it and it just happens, you know? Yeah, I think being able to control, um, I mean, I guess we're talking, essentially we're talking about light, yep. um, which is what most of photography revolves around. And I think when you're, when you're able to control something, I think there's a little bit more pressure um, to get it right because it is in your control. Yeah. Um, so that, that kind of challenge, and I don't, I shoot a lot more probably on location than I do in studio when it comes to fashion. Um, so with, but again, you can, by manipulating the location you're shooting in, by using reflectors and other sorts of things, you can still control the light. And I think when you're shooting, particularly one for a client and two where you can control um, a lot of these variables, there's a, there's a lot more pressure to get it right. And yeah. that, although it's kind of nerve wracking, particularly leading into it and sometimes can be stressful when you're there in location. I, I kind of like that challenge and I get more uh, gratification out of that end result. Yep. If I, if I nail it, whereas on the flip side, if you can't control a sunset, you can't control where those clouds are. Um, you work with it to the best of your ability and some people are better at it than others. But yep. at the end of the day, um, it kind of is what it is. Yeah, That's yeah. what you've got to work with. That's the sunrise you're working with on that day. That's the sunset you're working with on that day. So yes. it may be disappointing rather than um, kind of, how did I describe the, the other way? Rather than sort of, um, it's kind of disappointing if it doesn't come out, if it's not the sunset that you were chasing, yep. as opposed to um, that kind of like nervous feeling of being able to control it, but not getting it right. Yeah, got it. Yeah. So when when you do get that sunrise or sunset that you have been chasing, you know, is, is that a, a a feeling equivalent to nailing it in in the studio or in the on location where, where you can control the light, or is it or is it different again? Yeah, being in the moment is equivalent. Yeah. So I love being there when that sunrise, like the, the level of excitement when I'm on, when I'm out shooting a landscape and I get the fog that I want, or I get the sun, that the, the sunrise, yep. the sun rays, whatever it might be. Oh, I just did something and you go, yeah, wow, yeah. this is awesome. Yeah. 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 And, um, again, I think because there's no pressure behind it, I've taught myself to stop a little bit and enjoy it yep. without the viewfinder as well. So the level of excitement when I get those conditions, yeah, it is, it is matched. And um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> In terms of the shot itself, um, yeah, I mean, I, in terms of the the outcome, the the end result, I think the level of excitement of a good fashion image kind of trumps landscape image for me personally. Yeah, okay. But, but in the moment, yeah, in the moment, they're on par. Yeah, yeah cool, cool. So you mentioned, you know, the the people have started to sort of recognize your style how for people that haven't seen your work how would you describe it how would you describe your style what is what what is what makes a julian lalo yeah in terms of my in terms of my landscapes yeah i, I think like i mentioned they're, they're pretty sort of they're not over edited i wouldn't suggest they're pretty uh what you see is pretty much what i saw on the morning um so yeah i wouldn't suggest uh definitely they're not over edited my greens are pretty i think i find greens like a lot of people um i saw a twitter poll the other day and it <laughs> and it was something about what is the hardest color um, for you to edit or, or what do you find yeah. hard to nail in post-production and uh probably i think it was sort of around the 90 percent of people responded with with greens 
um, followed by yellows and then blues. Yeah. And um, I find greens really difficult as well. So for that fact, I tend to leave them as natural as possible. Yeah. And um, so I think my style is, I think my style may be more recognisable um, because of the types of locations, the types of conditions, and I shoot more so than like a really distinctive editing style or shooting style. I do like to capture scale. Um, that's one thing that, that I like to capture with my images. Um, so, yeah, prob- probably the conditions and, and, the, and the type of shot that I chase is okay. where my style is recognisable. Yeah. So I, I guess one of, one of the things in terms of, you know, developing style and, uh, and those sorts of things, are there any particular influences that have made you both shoot and also process the way that you do? Yeah, so I guess oh, I'm trying to think back to early days of Instagram who I used to really, it's <laughs> funny, not, not a lot of my first, the first people that I really, really love their work um, that kind of inspired me to shoot more were more in street photography than they were in um, than actual landscapes. I think landscapes I kind of fell into because living in Melbourne, you got far more options to shoot landscapes than really great street photography. Um, oh, there's some street photographers down there who would argue with that. Oh, there are. There are some great <laughs> ones. Um, and that's how you know that they're great because, mm. you know, I, I think – I was in Tokyo a couple of years back and just this morning I was looking at a few of the street photos that I took uh, on my film camera in Tokyo and I'm like, wow, this is just a point and shoot film and these photos are like incredible. And I'm like, I wonder, I don't know any laneway in Melbourne that I could point my film camera at and have an image just come out like this, like a point and shoot camera and an image end up like this. So you know they're a great street photographer when they're making Melbourne look as as good. I mean, we live in a beautiful city, but um, in terms of street photography, they, they, they definitely nail it. Um, so I think that's how I kind of started to shoot. I, I've completely rambled and lost the question. No, that's, that's fine. The question was, are there any influences that have... Uh, influences, yep. Yeah, um, guided your style. Yeah, so I always really, a couple of Aussie photographers that I've always really admired from, from the get-go, um, uh, a Sydney-based photographer, uh, Ben, uh, who's Ichban, goes by Ichban yep. on, um, on Instagram, Jared Seng from WA, um, yeah. I've always really admired his work and, and have been lucky enough to work with him on a few projects through Canon. Um, Stephen Vanasco was a really big influence on getting me to shoot. He's an LA based photographer, shoots a lot of aerial, shoots a lot of film, street photography, shoots a bit of everything. Um, yeah. And he was probably following him, made me want to just get out and shoot. Um, and then those other couple that I mentioned. And there's been many more along the way. I'm I'm really terrible with names, so no, that's <laughs> so um I can I can picture a heap of people that that I follow on social media that I'm like yeah I really love their work or yeah. really love their style or their their kind of their way of capturing capturing you know minimalistic scenes or their way of capturing scale has really inspired me. But names don't don't always come to me. <laughs> So in, ter- in terms of, uh, I guess, developing the style and, um, you know, working through that process of learning how to shoot and learning how to how, how to process, are you self-taught or have you, you know, gone, reached out for, you know, education resources elsewhere, or, you know, other than, you know, the, the usual YouTube, which, you know, I think, you know, to be honest, one of the, one of the best resources that, has there ever existed in terms of being able to learn to do something? Um, yeah, well, self-taught in terms of I never went to, to school or any have done any courses to learn, but I have, I mean, I've just, when I started out, I just made it my mission to shoot with as many different people from as many different genres as possible. Shot with street photographers, landscape photographers, uh, portrait photographers, and everybody teaches you a little something else regardless of genre at all and like I mentioned before photography is so much about light so if every little thing from every genre that you can learn about light I think helps you as a photographer and so I've I can um yeah thank so many people for for where I'm at today in terms of in terms of the skills that I've learned along the way yeah is there any anyone in particular that you go to for advice or you know do you just free will it in the beginning, what there was, there was a there was a photographer who who helped me out quite a quite a lot in the beginning. Used to lend me gear and used to sort of give me a, a lot of advice. These days, not so much. These days, it is um, YouTube. 
YouTube is is where I go to for some <laughs> advice. And and now I, I just really um, I study images a lot differently. Um, I study the light in images a lot differently, and that's how I'm kind of how I teach myself. Yeah, I'm um, trying to ever ever sort of evolve my craft is just by studying other people's images that I really admire. Yeah. So in terms of uh, <clears throat> deciding to go out and uh, and shoot, are you sort of look at the conditions and do a lot of planning up front or do you just sort of wake up on the day and go where it, where it feels best? Um, generally, I look, I have a rough look at the, at the weather forecast and what the clouds are doing. Again, like with my camera gear, I'm not super technical with weather either. I've got some mates that I kind of, if I'm shooting with them, I leave it to them and I trust their judgment because they can read weather charts way better than me. Fair but enough. um yeah i just sort of look at generally if i'm going to the black spur i'll look at um sort of look at temperature wind speed and, and humidity um yep. that's they're pretty much the three variables that i look at for fog yeah. and um in terms of sunrises and sunsets you know i've got mates that know that in summer at the sunset in this spot at this time and shooting from this direction and that composition is is best um yeah, I'm not great with all that sort of stuff. So, so you're not um, in, I can pick, not not pouring over photo pills or uh, one of the other apps to. I don't even have any of them. No, I kind of like I said, I I use it as a chance to catch up with mates. So I make sure I shoot with one of my mates. That's um that's that's that all glued up that on. sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. That's good. So what uh, what what about when you get on site? What what is your shooting process? You know what what are you looking for in in a location, and what what are the things that you're sort of you know got in the back of your mind when you when you sort of step out of the car or where you know wherever you are and uh, decide okay this is where I'm going to pl plant the tripod or this is where I'm going to stand. What what are yeah. the things you're looking for? Yeah, well, it's definitely more stand. Um, often I don't bring a tripod with me. I, I like sort of shooting most things um, uh, handheld. Um, I don't shoot a lot of long exposures. Um, okay. I did when I was starting out, but, yeah, not so much anymore. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I guess it's – I look for light and scale, I guess, would be the two things that I, I look for. I think for me, um, trying, to, trying to give that sense of scale – Mm -hmm. uh to any to the landscapes that i that i shoot and then the way the light's hitting them so if i can find a composition where i get some beautiful light and and show off a nice sense of scale i think that's my they're my go-to's and um and obviously you know throwing a a, a figure in a in a uh, getting someone to stand in to to accentuate that sense of scale is always a oh, always the, a bonus. The red, yellow or red jacket <laughs> oh yeah the instagram favorite yeah <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or, or someone with a hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gone, yeah. Well, lucky gone are the days of the fairy lights. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess, um, you know, it, particularly uh, around your local area, what, um, I, I guess, what, what are the, the, the key things in that area that, you know uh, are attracting you obviously the forests but you know aside from that you know you mentioned wilson's prom if you're headed down that way are you into the forests again or are you looking for coastal um seascapes or cliffs or yeah we're, we're really lucky to have um really beautiful uh some really beautiful coastline around so yeah definitely definitely seascapes um in in most other than sort of grampians um, there's some really beautiful seascapes in in all directions. All those other locations I mentioned earlier. Great Ocean um, Road, of course. And, yeah, Great and Ocean Road, and, and then that, they're, they're hiding under a rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and then Mornington Peninsula. That's only sort of an hour and a hour and a bit from from Melbourne. So really beautiful coastline down there. I fly a drone as well. So um, that also, yeah, beautiful. Getting some beautiful perspectives from the drone of um shooting some uh, seascapes sorry about uh, so when when you're using the drone what percentage of your work do you would you say would be drone based versus uh either handheld or you know just the 
the, the camera as opposed yeah. to a drone camera? Yeah, I think that might largely depend on the conditions of the day. Mm -hmm. If the conditions aren't, like, like I said, if it's not the sunrise or the sunset that I was chasing, um, I probably tend to use gravitate to the drone a little bit more because I think you can find a, a different perspective that can still be interesting without sort of accentuating the, the sunrise sunset. Um, so on days like that, I'd probably go to the drone a little bit more so that I come away with a few images. Um, if not, I am definitely more, I, I think there's more of a challenge to shooting with the, with the camera shooting handheld than there is to a drone um, because obviously you've got uh, far fewer perspectives or compositions that you can, you can capture depending on where you're shooting. So I, when the opportunity is there, I'd, I'd rather shoot handheld with the camera, most definitely. Sure, sure. I guess uh, in talking to you, you know, I get a sense that, you know, you're obviously uh, quite keen on, um, you know, the environment. I guess how important is it to you in, in, in showing that environment off uh, to, to, to people and getting them aware of, uh, you know, environmental concerns and, and issues? Yeah, I think that's... That's actually a really good point and something that I've always been one to sort of, I've always done a lot of outdoor activities. So I've always ridden mountain bikes and I surf. So I've always had an appreciation for, um, for getting outdoors and, for, and I've always been in and around these beautiful sort of landscapes. But it wasn't until I started photography and sharing it on social media that I realised how many people don't know what's at their back door. And... People think that, you know, I mean, the Black Spur, like I said, is 50, 45, 50 minutes from Melbourne, one of the most sort of beautiful areas you can ever lay your eyes on and how many Melburnians don't know it exists. Yeah, and it wasn't until, yeah. yeah, exactly right. And even down the coast, like people thought, oh, like what country is this in? You know, I, I was, I've asked, been asked by people in Melbourne, like, well, where, did you <laughs> like where did you travel to get this photo? I'm like, oh, I jumped in the car the on Saturday morning and I drove down the road. Yeah. And um, so I think it's, yeah, it, it, it's become a really big part of why I shoot and share as well. And um, yeah, I, I think social media in that respect has done some really great things for the environment because it has got people out into these landscape situations more and more open their eyes to what's at their back door mm. And in their own country, particularly in their own state, in their own city. And I think the more people that the more people get out in these environments and landscapes, the more they start to then respect them themselves. Um, so yeah, it's it's yeah, really important factor and, and something that I never thought would be so rewarding from sharing these, taking these photos and sharing them. But yeah, it really is. Yeah, yeah. What's the most memorable experience you've had whilst uh, out shooting? Oh, wow. Um, I think there's many of them, but one that, which is kind of a comical one and is probably the most memorable, I, I'm trying to think. I've completely lost track of what year was what uh, since this last sort of year and a half. I've kind of blurred all the, all the years together a little bit, but I think it was uh, maybe about three, four years ago. Um, I was in Italy with my wife and we went to Lago de Braz, which a lot of people would know it was kind of the Instagram hotspot of yep. probably three, four years ago uh, in the Alps in Italy. And this beautiful lake where you've got a cliff face, sometimes snow capped at the end of it, still day reflection, little boathouse. And we were staying in a place called uh, Cortina d'Ampezzo, which is probably about an hour away got up for sunrise. My wife doesn't like waking up for sunrise, convinced her to wake up for sunrise. We drove there. I was so in awe of this place that I just completely pretty much forgot how to use a composite, uh, how to use a camera. I could not make a composition to save myself. Mm. And I just, yeah, I was just stunned uh, yeah. by the location. And I came away with no photos that I liked completely wow. just, I was shattered and um, I was shattered, but still, you know, on, on top of the, on top of the world, but shattered that I had no photos. So we went back the next, I got her to wake up again and we went back the next morning <laughs> and, um, and I was completely camera focused, but um, that, that's probably one of the most memorable places that I've, 
that I've shot and all through that region in Italy is, um, is just absolutely stunning. I, um, yeah, I would love to get back there in a, I get back there in a heartbeat and, um, and shoot it all again. I guess to- talking about uh, overseas travel in particular, does has the pandemic changed your attitude towards travel and travel photography in particular, or is it just still too raw and too early? And you know, you haven't haven't been able to get out of Australia to to, to get anywhere. Yeah, it, it came at a really bad. Uh, I think leading up to the pandemic, I had um, three international jobs within a two month period. So I was doing quite a bit of uh, international travel and, and, and had got a few um, tourism campaigns and one fashion campaign all overseas. And so that kind of, unfortunately, the, the pandemic put a stop to that and I had a few booked. Um, but so I am hanging to start traveling again with a young family. I'm happy enough, though, to, to stay in Australia at the moment and, and make sure that we all stay safe. Mm. Um, but it's also just, I mean, I recently, I'd never been to far north Queensland before. Okay. Uh, while my wife was pregnant with our first couple of years ago, we, um, we went up to far north Queensland. I went to Fitzroy Island. We went through Cairns and nice. Daintree. It's so bloody beautiful. And, yeah. you know, I think that our first trip, regardless of when the borders open up and how safe it's going to be, I still think our first trip is going to be, um in australia there's so much there's so much beauty in at our back door and it's kind of it's hard sometimes because it is cheaper for us in australia to travel overseas sometimes and um for for a week or two weeks away but um yeah I, i think you know i'm fine as much as i'd love to love to get overseas and and shoot a few few different cities and um around the world i'm I'm fine hanging out in Australia for a while and hopefully I've never been to WA. Oh, I've been to WA once, but it was a work trip and didn't see much of it. And I know there's some beautiful coastline and yeah. over there that I, I've, I'm yet to shoot. So, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm fine hanging out in Australia for a while and all going well, getting to, to see a bit more of it. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, do you have any horror stories, I guess, from your photo career, either, you know, your professional career or you, or, or the, you know, relaxation side of it. Uh, horror stories. I'm, oh, I'm sure there are plenty of horror stories, um, but maybe I've buried them deep down in my brain that I can't think of any. <laughs> I can think of one that's probably a bit of a boring one that's um, was a, uh, I did a, a headshot shoot at a uh, university here in Melbourne and it kind of, yeah, it's, it went wrong for all so many reasons and it's why I don't shoot headshots anymore and um <laughs> why, why i'm so happy that i can be a little bit more picky with the work i can take on but that's a horror story that's a bit of a boring one so i won't get into that but um seems, no, seems traumatized you though <laughs> yeah yeah it did grant it did. <laughs> it did all right moving on <laughs> have you ever hit a creative wall and uh if so how did you handle it uh yeah often but i've yeah, especially through this last two years, through the pandemic, where I wasn't really picking up my camera at all. Mm. Um, uh, it was really hard to get back into shooting anything creative after that. Um, it was hard to stay creative through the pandemic, which is why I started the YouTube channel, but then even that started getting difficult. Um, yep. How did I get out of it? I went to my favourite place. Like I mentioned, this is the reason I go there, the Black Spur, and... I went there with my camera with the intention to take some photos and I didn't take any photos that day. I just hung out in the black spur and enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I, I think the key, my takeaway from that is to stop that I need to, when I get that creative block, I get too much in my own head. So I kind of need to stop and just forget about it and not try to get out of my creative block, just relax. And um yeah, not not force it, and it kind of comes back. It's so one of the one of the things that uh, I've seen uh, from you on Twitter is uh, you've started to get into NFTs. What is it that sort of drew you into that, and how did you how did you get started with that? Um, I guess, if I'm being honest, the reason I got started and what drew me into it was 
uh, was the ETH, was the Ethereum, um, which, which I think is, yeah, I mean, I think most people would be telling a lie if they said they didn't initially get into it for, for the thought that they can um, stack a bit of ETH or earn a bit of money from it. And, and that's why I got in and minted my first image on Foundation and a friend of mine, Tom Juan, uh, gave me the invite and he had sold a few pieces and I saw a few other friends sell some work and that's probably what initially got me into it. That, that was probably about six or seven months ago. That yep. particular piece is still sitting there on foundation and, but I'm still in it and I'm still in love with NFTs every day and um, buying, I've, I've sold some other work. I've bought a lot of other photographers work. And, and like I said, in the beginning, I'm like, Oh, I'm going to sell pieces, but there's no way I'm going to invest any of, I'm going to invest any, like, that's crazy. Like it, it was kind of, you know, but that's just being honest. And now I've collected yeah, yeah. from like 20, 25 different photographers and, so I think what that being in the community and when I got into it, there was this whole thing about you've got to be in the community to sell work. And I was like, community, like I just, I didn't get it. And then coming, coming from here, Instagram where it's sort of dog yeah, eat dog and yeah. It is. Yeah. And then you, you get into, uh, you spend some time on Twitter and then you hang out in Twitter spaces, which for those that aren't familiar with Twitter spaces, it's kind of like a, um, well, I guess it's a space where you can talk. It's an audio space where you can get in and talk and there's 12 people on stage and um, that can talk to each other and then people listening in in an audience that can request to get up and speak. So you're having real life conversations with people mm -hmm. and you start building friendships and relationships and, and that's when the mindset starts to change from, hey, I can sell an NFT and I can earn some money and not reinvest it to, oh, well, I really want to support that person and I really want to buy their piece. So I really hope I sell something soon so that I can reinvest it in someone else. And um, so that's kind of, yeah, if I'm being honest, the, the journey of my journey in NFTs, it was to list a piece and hopefully sell it and, and then be done with it and list another one. But it, it's kind of turned into something that I just really love. I love hanging out, hanging out on Twitter and, and, um, and in that community that, Mm. Um, that kind of all have similar passions. And I, what else I've really enjoyed about it is on Instagram, I used to, f I, I follow landscape photographers that shoot similar to me and I shoot and I follow fashion photographers. And whereas my eyes have been open to so many other genres of photography, like storm chasing, I didn't know it was a thing. Like I knew people chase storms, but I never knew people photographed these storms. And, and then, you know, there's, I mean, I've always been obsessed with underwater photography, but now there's, you know, I can actually chat with these underwater photographers and listen to them speak and street mm. photo. I've, it's sort of re-inspired me to shoot some street photography. And um, it's in terms of kind of creative blocks, Twitter and the NFT community is a really sort of inspirational place for those creative blocks because you, you look at things, if you have, by looking at something else and taking your mind off your creative block or your genre or focus, I think it really inspires. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where do you see it, I guess, in the, you know, obviously, um, and I don't know, you obviously have the more commercial side of your work, which is you selling your talent as a photographer, as opposed to selling individual creative pieces. Um, do you do you sell your creative pieces as, as prints uh, in physical media or do you tend not to do that? And where do you see, I guess, NFTs in that? um you know spectrum of you you're marketing your your brand and your your type of photography yeah so in terms of the physical prints that was the first job for me that i gave myself during the pandemic was to set up a print store so that i had another form of passive income mm -hmm. um depending on how long this this pandemic was going to go for and these lockdowns and i got pretty much to the end point of setting up um setting up my print store when I discovered the NFTs yep. and that kind of put a stop to the print store. Um, not yep. because I don't want to sell prints anymore because I just got too fixated on NFTs. Um, I also saw the value in selling my work as an NFT over selling a print, um, how many prints I would need to sell uh, to earn the same sort of value as selling an NFT is, is crazy if you do the math. So that kind of put a little bit of a, a stop I just kind of weighed up the time investment in um so no i don't i mean if somebody reaches out to me i'll do prints one of ones um but no i don't have a print store 
And in terms of how I see myself marketing my work through NFTs, I'm, I'm kind of at this little bit of a, a crossroad at the moment because I got known on uh, sort of Instagram is really good at pigeonholing you because if you don't post the work that people know you for, you don't get engagement. And if you don't get engagement, then it plays with your mind and you don't want to post that work again. So Instagram pigeonholed me as this landscape photographer that shoots foggy green scenes, uh, which is great, but I've moved on a little bit. Yeah, I've moved on a little bit as a person, you know, and I shoot a lot more fashion and I want to get more creative with my portraiture and, and fashion photography. And I, my original collection um, that I dropped on OpenSea was called The Crossing and it was uh, shot in uh, the Shibuya Crossing in, in Tokyo. Yep. And it was kind of, I guess, a, a street, I guess you'd call it a street photography collection, not a traditional street photography. It was kind of from up a, a high perspective and um, it was just uh, colourful taxis, different coloured taxis going across a across the crossing but and that was that was great and that sold out and I thought what was next and I wasn't really getting out and shooting because it was still mid-pandemic so I thought well this is what has uh, kind of made my name in terms of Instagram and social media is these moody greens I'm going to make a collection around these greens and in sharing all that I've now found myself getting pigeonholed again into the landscape photographer on on Twitter and in, in NFTs. So I'm at kind of a little bit of a crossroads, whereas and I really want to do something completely different going forward with NFTs. So I'm at that little bit of a crossroad in, in terms of how to actually do that. Um, because I've noticed when I do, again, on Twitter, post something different, the engagement is, is different as well. So, and um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. When I started Twitter, I said to myself, I'm not going to, I'm going to just share all my work. This is really refreshing. I'm going to share everything. Yep. And um, again, I can feel that kind of, um, I can feel that changing and I can feel myself slipping back into the, into the ways of Instagram. So it's sort of a, something that I'm, I'm working on at the moment in, in terms of how to, to rebrand myself to the creative that I am today rather than the creative that got me here. Yeah, yeah, got it. I guess it's a bit like, uh, you know, some musicians where, you know, the fans are clamouring for, for for the old stuff, but you've got all this new material that you want to get out into the world yep. and people kind of go, yeah, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> yeah, 100%, 100%. Hit, hit me with the hits from 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I guess where, where do you stand in terms of, I mean, obviously you've made the plunge, but um, what, what's your feeling in terms of, you know, there's a lot of uh, controversy in particular around the environmental impact, um, you know, particularly with the, the Ethereum blockchain and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I've seen reports which, you know, say that it's, you know, as, you know, one, um, Ethereum uh, transaction is, you know, takes about a, a household's monthly electricity to process, you know, now whether or not that's entirely true or, or not, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but you know, with those sorts of reports around where, where do you stand, I guess, in terms of that environmental impact that might be there from uh, some of these things? Yeah, well, I hadn't, I mean, I, I, I'm aware that there's an environmental impact and I hadn't heard any figures like that. So that's, that's really quite alarming. And at the same time, I'd be hypocritical, like investing in crypto and, and mm. minting NFTs, buying and selling NFTs. I'd be hypocritical if I said that um, I'm all about, um, I'm completely against it uh, and the environmental impact. I guess my hopes rest in, the devs and ETH 2.0 and and I know that there are um, they are building more sustainable um, crypto mining facilities. Um, I guess my hopes are in the fact that that all sort of uh, develops sooner rather than later. Yeah. Uh, yeah. At this at this rate, um, I guess it's not building a sustainable future. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I guess that, that's one of the things that I'm sort of, I'm I'm kind of torn. I've, you know, I'm full disclosure. I've, uh, you know, invested a little bit in ETH and uh, 
you know, bought some NFTs and also, you know, sold a couple. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of at that point where I'm going, okay, well, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where, where I go with it um, personally. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't said this, you know, very publicly, but I'm just about to, I guess, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, for for me, I'm I, I'm definitely torn about where where it currently stands, um, and you know, and it's one of the things that I'm really interested in exploring, you know, and using the podcast in particular to do that. And uh, I've got a a couple of other people lined up that I'm you know really keen to talk to about their views, um, both for and against, because you know I like to. I like to do a bit of research on both sides. I think, you know, for me, it's really about whether or not there's, a, you know, and it's always difficult, is is there accurate reporting? But then you look at photographers, you know, landscape photographers that are, you know, happy to fly to, you know, remote locations, et cetera, and, you know, there's the carbon footprint of everything that they're doing as well, you know, and... I, I don't know where where the, the the right lay of the land actually is, but um, I, I think it's an important thing for people to discuss and and, and have a think about, you know. Uh, and I'm not trying to dissuade you or sway you e either way in this. It's you know I'm I'm relatively neutral about it uh, myself, um, but it, it is something that I, I I just like to explore with people and understand their their views and and where they stand on it. Yeah, ab absolutely. Something that probably needs to be brought to the forefront of a lot of people's um, attention. I, I'm probably not well versed enough about it to, mm. to make, to make full judgments, but from what I, yeah, from what I have heard, I, I do hope that um, uh, these solar powered um, mining and sustainable mining yeah. does become become more forefront yeah definitely so i guess um what are what tips have you got for somebody that would just be starting out in landscape photography my tips for landscape photography are probably the same as for any genre of photography and that that would be to shoot as much as you can shoot with as many different people as you can shoot with um, because they are your best teachers um, particularly people that are more experienced than you and um, shoot, in all, shoot in all conditions. And also shoot, when you're starting out, shoot every genre. Shoot portraits, shoot landscapes, shoot street photography, um, learn lighting because photography is all about lighting. I think that's the, like the third reference to it in this, since we've been chatting, photography is all about light. So if you can learn a little bit of something about photography and light from every genre, it's only going to make you better a better photographer at whatever photography you choose to do. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, that'd be my my key key tips. All right. So what do you like to do when you're not shooting? Where, you know, obviously it's it, it's work, but it's also a hobby. So, you know, what what do you do when you're not got a camera? Um, these days, I, well, I have uh, a nearly three-year-old son and a nearly one-year-old daughter. So these days when I'm not shooting, I am... Um, it's a handful. Yeah. They are, they are keeping me very busy. Um, I, uh, I would like to say I still, so oh, I, I bodyboard, but I would like to say I still surf a bit, but I don't, that is what I would probably like to be doing a little bit more of when I'm not shooting. Yeah. Um, so at the moment it's family shooting, shooting predominantly for work, not so much for pleasure, hobby at the moment, but, um, and, and NFTs take up a hell of a lot of time as you, as you probably know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. What's the best thing about being a photographer? I meet lots of people, particularly shooting, shooting fashion, hang out with lots of different interesting people. And, and for me, it's the flexibility of it, um, yeah. especially with a young family. The flexibility that being a, a full-time freelancer gives me is just is fantastic. Yeah. What's the worst thing? The stack of hard drives that I'm looking at right now that I don't know <laughs> where to keep. or, or the, um, No, the worst thing... What is the worst thing? I, I, I love shooting more than I love editing. So in terms, so photography specific for me, it's probably editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's okay. That's fair probably enough. it. 
So are there any photographers out there that uh, you think I should be talking to on the podcast? Any any names you'd like to drop that uh, I, I should get in touch with? Uh, yeah, so just trying to think. Lately there's a, there's a photographer that I really uh, recently discovered on um on Twitter, who's probably, who's not in the landscape genre, but he's someone, a photographer that has really inspired me of late is his name is, I'm going to probably stuff up his surname, but it's Grace, Grayson Luffenberger. And he's a black and white portrait photographer, very yeah. conceptual. Um, he's a really, really, uh, he's inspired me a lot. I really love his work and I've only recently come across him in terms of landscape photographers. Um, Another photographer that I've only really recently come across, she's a uh, Kiwi. She's a New Zealand-based um, landscape photographer, Alan Kayford. Mm -hmm. Kayford. Um, really beautiful, um, really beautiful landscapes. Just love her. Really beautiful, fresh, crisp editing style. Um, and I don't know much about her, so I'd love you to have a chat with her so I can learn a little more. And Yep. I'll put her on the list. Excellent. All right. I've got one last and probably the most important question uh, of, of right. the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm like, nervous now. Hit me. Uh, do you like pineapple on pizza? Oh, mate, I could make a podcast in itself about this topic. I, pizza is very close to my heart, but for the essence of time, I'm going to just say no. No, that's a very Italian answer. <laughs> yes. Yep, yep. Yeah, no, I, uh, I made, I, uh, I was a chef before. Uh, I got into sales and then photography and, and I made pizza for many years and, and uh, worked in Rome also for, for quite a while uh, in a pizzeria. So very close to my heart. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> I knew you'd have a strong opinion on it. <laughs> like I said, that's a, that's a podcast for another day. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> All right, well, thanks so much for uh, taking the time out to uh, talk to me today, uh, Julian. I've really enjoyed catching up with you and uh, it's fantastic to hear about how you do your thing. Where can people find your work? Yeah, thanks, Grant. Thanks for, for having me. Um, I guess I'm on uh, Instagram and predominantly probably a little bit more Twitter these days, at Julian Lalo. Um, that, that's all my kind of travel landscape um, photography. Uh, Julian Lalo Photography on Instagram is my fashion work and uh, and I'm also on YouTube under the same name. So, Very good. All right. Well, thanks again. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work and this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon. Mm -hmm.